by Councillor Hamler. Please bow your heads. Dear Lord, as we begin this new year, we pray for your guidance to serve the good people of Enfield. We pray for the wisdom to make the decision that the decision that affect our community. We pray that those in our community that struggle to make ends meet. We pray for the youth as they attend our schools. We pray for our town staff and the work that that the hard work that they do to make Enfield a great place to live. And we pray for the first responders and our military who provide peace and safety for all. We pray in our Lord's name. Amen. 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 Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll we'll call, please, Suzanne. Councillor Hemmler? Here. Councillor Kiner? Here. Mayor Ludwig? Here. Councillor Mangini? Here. Councillor Muller? Here. Councillor Riley? Here. Councillor Sferrazzo? Here. Deputy Mayor Suzak? Here. Councillor Ungeier? Here. Councillor Bosco? Here. Councillor Sakala? Here. There's 11 members present, none are absent. Moving on to item four, fire evacuation. In case of a fire, we have exits in the back of the room. Please go orderly to your left or your right. We also have exits to our left and the audience's right. Please go through the doors, go out the door to your left, down the stairs, and out in the parking lot in case of a, in case of a fire. Uh, moving on to item five, minutes of the preceding meeting. Special meeting December 16, 2019. Do I have a motion to approve? Motion to approve. By Councillor Mangini, seconded by Councillor Mother. Is there any additions, deletions, corrections? Hearing none by show of hands, all those in favor? Opposed? Abstentions? Ten in favor, one abstention. Moving on to regular meeting December 16, 2019. Do I have a motion to approve? By Councillor Muller. Second. Seconded by Councillor Riley. Is there any additions, deletions, or corrections? Hearing none by a show of hands, all those in favor? Opposed? Abstentions? Ten in favor, one abstention. Moving on to item six, special guests. Um, please uh, Bob, can we call Bob Grisotti and Ed Denny, please. Things are heavy. Folks wouldn't mind going around. service to the town of Enfield. First, Mr. Ed Denny. These are very nice, by the way, folks. You want to see them on TV? These things are awesome. Look at that. Well done. It has the Enfield seal. Mr. Edward Denny, thank you for your years of service and dedication, 2013 to 2000, 2019, on behalf of the Enfield Town Council and the Enfield Town Administration. Well done, sir. Happy New Year. Again, very well done. Very want to make sure everyone sees it. For Mr. Bob Crisati, thank you for your years of service and dedication, 2017 and 2019, on behalf of the Enfield Town Council and the Town Administration. Thank you, sir. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Anyone like to say anything? Thank you, gentlemen. Appreciate it. Happy New Year, gentlemen. And if we could call in the Ramblers while we're here. You guys want to maybe, I don't know if, maybe we'll let the Ramblers come up for you guys. I don't know if there'll be enough room, hopefully. Right, I tell the Ramblers come on in. Yeah, there sounds some fun. Come on in, fellas, let's go. Come on in, you're coming up here. Come on. Come on, guys, come on. Come on up. Five. Look at that. Who's that? Who's that? Joey's dreams are growing. Joey's dreams are growing. What's happening? All right. It is an honor. All right, so you guys are all going to speak, right? Yeah. <laughs> we are honored to have the Enfield 2019 Enfield Ramblers C team. 
And who wants us to tell the town of Enfield what your record was? We were 11 and 0. 11 and 0. Woo! All right. So I'm going to let this young gentleman, because I was at the game and he made a great play. What, what did you win down in Tallinn? Stole a football. And then what did you guys do as a team? What did you end up winning? Super Bowl. Super Bowl, huh? All right. <laughs> We joke about making Enfield title town. You guys went out and did it. If we want to make Enfield title town, you guys should be uh, proud of yourselves. You were down 12 nothing in the first quarter or second quarter. You guys hung in there, and you came back and won 26-12? Yeah, yeah huh? pretty cool. So on, on your behalf, we have a proclamation on behalf of the town of Enfield for you, gentlemen. Proclama proclamation congratulating the 2019 Enfield Ramblers C team on their undefeated season and NCFL Super Bowl championship. Whereas the Enfield Town Council wishes to recognize and congratulate the Enfield Ramblers C team for their 2019 season in the NCFL Football League. Whereas the Enfield Ramblers made history by finishing the season with a perfect 8-0 season in the NCFL and went on to win the playoffs, capping the season with a 26-13 victory over the Ellington Roadrunners. Whereas the hard work, dedication, sportsmanship, talent and exceptional team chemistry of the Enfield Ramblers C team enabled these athletes to earn the NFCL Super Bowl championship title, whereas their success is testament to the collaboration, collaborative spirit, community of the entire Enfield Ramblers family, which includes the players, coaches, parents, and board members. Whereas the Enfield Town Council is proud to honor each of the players of this year's roster and give special thanks to the team coaches for their work within the commitment to these young men as well as their support of the youth activities in the Enfield community. And by the way, the moms were dressed up ready to play and at the uh, Super Bowl, by the way. <laughs> now, therefore, I, Michael Ludwig, the mayor of the town of Enfield, on behalf of the town council, the town administration, the entire community, do hereby congratulate the Enfield Ramblers C team on their undefeated 2019 season and their NCFL Super Bowl championship. Well done, gentlemen. Well done. <laughs> Come on, over. Come on, coach. Come on, bring the trophy. So, which, and I'm, I'm nervous to ask which coach is going to speak because I heard the, the victory speech. <laughs> Who you're going to. Welcome. Here you go, sir. Oh. You all got, don't worry, I'll take the rest. I'll take the rest. Well, I just definitely want to say congratulations to these Ramblers C team players. I've watched them grow over the years. I've been with them for three and four years. We had a bunch of new players this year that made great contributions to the team. They played strong. They fought hard every single day. Practice. Again, if anybody was at the championship, they've seen me fired up, so they deal with the coach. <laughs> Congratulations to everyone. Thank you to every single one of these coaches. Something I missed in my speech, okay? These coaches here did an awesome job. I couldn't have done it without them. They were the fire to keep us going. Again, congratulations to everybody, coaches, players. Thank you all very much for such hard work and a great season. Yeah, one more last time. Folks, pitchers with the Enfield Rambler C team. Get that trophy there. Yes. Everyone get their pictures? Well done. Thank you, guys. You get to see this on Channel 16. All right? And you guys all YouTube. It'll be on YouTube. It'll be on YouTube. 16. Nice job. Nice job, fellas. Are you right. ready to go? Yeah, I don't know. It's up to you. If you're enterprising. <laughs> Good job, fellas. Yeah, I'd like to have that. I want to get a friend. Good job, buddy. Maybe that's. Oh, sorry, Carl. <laughs>
Thank you very much. Thank Thanks for coming. Very uh, tough act to follow, but um, we're going to call up Mr. Ken Boulay to follow that act. Well, they're approaching, Mr. Mayor. I'll just indicate that consistent with our policy of introducing new directors and deputy directors to the council and the community, we're keeping with that tradition this evening. Um, Donna will introduce Ken, give you some background, but I'm just uh, very, very uh, satisfied and uh, appreciative that we did a search. We had very qualified individuals apply for the deputy director position, and it's always a blessing when you have people within your organization who, over the course of their careers, and in Ken's case, over 40 years dedication to the town of Enfield, rise to that level, and we were able to pick a person of his caliber, integrity, and professionalism, and dedication to the town from within our own ranks, and that's the type, type of person we were fortunate enough to get with Ken. Without further ado, I'll give you the director, Donald. Good evening. So, so again, as you know, Ken has been here for 40 plus years working for the town of Enfield. And that's a really important aspect to understand is that is the institutional knowledge that comes with that. You know, newer hires or whatever don't have that kind of understanding of, of the town, how things happen in the past, whether good or bad. But again, that institutional knowledge is there. And, and Ken is, it <clears throat> has used that to his advantage. <clears throat> over the last few months as in our transitional role from when the previous assistant director left. Um, Ken has been taking on increasing responsibilities even though as he wasn't the assistant director at the time, but he stepped, he's been stepping up and taking on those roles that, that I needed from him <coughs> and he was proving to me all along the way that this was the right step for him. Again, he started off in trash. Back of the rubbish truck. <laughs> yeah, back of the rubbish truck, and in a short, in a short forty plus years later, he's now the assistant director of uh, public works. So, um, he's absolutely shown that he he can do this job, and it's going to be a pleasure working with him for the next hopefully more than three years. But again, he's he's close to retirement. So, but again, I appreciate all his help, and again, I hope you understand. Again, he's. That institutional knowledge, I'm telling you, is a, is a really big thing. And it's helped me. It's helped all of our directors, my assistant directors and the like. It's helped all of us. And again, he stepped up, and I really appreciate that from him. So, Thank you, sir. I know uh, you love the public speak, so we're going to give you the floor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I didn't write a speech or anything. But uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the town manager, Steve Belinda, and Donald, uh, especially uh, town manager and Donald's kind words. Um, I can't tell you how appreciative I am of this opportunity. I love this community. Uh, I hear you, Mayor, always talking about your love for the community. Um, it's a great place to work, to step up these responsibilities. I will work as hard as I always have and put the town taxpayers, and we have a great workforce, and put them first. And, you know, I'm hoping to go longer than three years, Donald. <laughs> <laughs> That's my plan. So uh, hopefully I can uh, keep building on everything that I've been doing and, you know, like I say, continue to serve the community that I truly love and been here my whole life. So I'm not going anywhere. My wife won't let me go to Florida when I retire or anything. So um, but it's just a great opportunity and I'll try to take, the, you know, this workforce to the next level. Any questions for Ken? Well, if I may, one one more deciding factor was that again he's a, he's a Bruins lifelong fan. Bruins fan, so I just needed to throw that in there. I'm sorry. So fine print any application. <laughs> Council Sraza and Council Ungar. It's not a question, but Ken, congratulations, excellent choice. You're going to do a great job, and I got to tell you, whenever we have the opportunity to hire from within, and you started in '79, and now you're the deputy director, I think it sends a great message to all our employees. And I'm so happy we're able to find someone like you from within our own organization. So congratulations, Ken. Thank you for the kind words, and thank you, Chief. Councilor Ngar. Ken, I just wanted to wish you a heartfelt congratulations. I've known you since before the 40 years. So I think you're, you'll do an excellent job. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Anyone else? Well, I know you're a heck of a soccer coach, and I also know you uh, throw a mean elbow in a basketball game. So uh, <laughs> congratulations, sir. I mean, well earned. Thank you, Mayor Mike. Thank you both. Appreciate it. Thank you both for coming. Moving over to item six, or excuse me, I apologize, item seven, uh, public communications petitions. We will uh, 
asked the public to come up. And again, we asked that folks refrain from personalities. We are at 7.15, so we have an hour. Anyone would like to speak for the council at this time? Ms. Sullivan. Welcome. Thank you. Gina Sullivan, 11 Spear Avenue. I am here tonight to express my sheer disgust at the, uh, the underhanded way the vote took place for the closure of the Enfield Adult Day Center. I took some time to read the minutes from the May 20th budget meeting and wanted to respond to a couple comments because lack of knowledge on this subject is appalling when used as an excuse. Mayor Ludwig, you said many times that this program is not successful due to the changing market and that people are choosing to stay at home. This could not be further from the truth. Let me clarify a few things. People are choosing to stay home longer to avoid a nursing home. Adult day centers are the reason residents are able to stay in their homes longer because it provides a structured day with socialism and recreation for residents in need, as well as respite for families caring for them. Please stop spreading false information. Councillor Sferaza, your comments pitted one group of seniors against another. Why do we always seem to pit one group against another here in Enfield? You think since an alternate program is available at the Felician Sisters, that somehow that makes this decision okay. Tell me, have you, or any of you for that matter, ever moved a loved one with dementia to a brand new situation? Councillor Ungeyer, you also referenced market is changing and you are perfectly fine with putting clients into a brand new situation thinking that's the answer. I ask you this, how many residents at Blair Manor passed away sadly shortly after they were relocated to another facility when they closed? Think about that for a moment. Deputy Mayor Suzak, you spoke to building maintenance, which is also needed for the adult day center building. You blamed a failed referendum. And I just have to ask, why do you people keep blaming failed referendums for maintenance of our buildings? Isn't maintenance something that should have been done over the past 10 years to all of our buildings? Please stop blaming the taxpayers for the work you didn't do all these years. It was also said at the May 20th meeting that the center would stay open for at least one more year. So why the sudden vote that no one was aware of? Not employees, not clients, not families, no one. Until the town council meeting right before the holidays. Because you knew no one was, would be paying attention at the time of the year. Was that part of the plan? Or was it because the day center had reached 14 clients and just had a new client start the day of this vote? Did the rising client count not fit your agenda to close so you had to move fast? Would love to hear an explanation of how this vote came to be on December 16th. Truth please, no lies. Since budget constraints was the reason for closing this program, I expect that no town monies will be given to any nonprofits moving forward. If money is that tight that we had to close this relatively inexpensive and wonderful program to save $190,000, then we should have no business giving any money to nonprofits in any form. Let's reflect for a moment. Under Republican majority, we gave Hazardville Institute $300,000 and that building is still empty. Remember the Enfield Community Development Program? How much money did the Enfield taxpayers sink into that mess? Were loans ever paid back? Funny how this story skulked into oblivion. Didn't we buy that carpet building twice? Or casket building, I'm sorry, twice? And lest we forget, every July, Enfield tax dollars are spent on, and Carl, you'll appreciate this, police presence at the 4th of July celebration. Just an example of a few nonprofits getting town money while our most vulnerable disabled seniors are left to figure it out. 
not, exe not exactly representation for all. Just your friends? Is that how this works? 30 seconds. How do nonprofits rate higher than town programs? If you were truly concerned about budget constraints, these items would be the first off the list of monies provided by the town. But we all know why they're not. I'll come back. Thank you. Thank you. And I was like, Steve Young. Welcome. Thank you. Good evening, Council, Town Manager. Um, I know last month that the Council voted not to continue the adult daycare for approximately 10 people. Name with address, George. George Young, 8 Holly Lane, Enfield. Sorry about that. No I'm new. With only two of them being Enfield residents. There is a projected, there's projected to be a budget deficit of $150,000 for the year, and it did make monetary sense to discontinue it based on those numbers. When we have sent our children to schools outside of Enfield, we always had to pay for that to be done. This question is for the Councilor Bosco and the, or the town manager. Have we ever considered asking towns other than Enfield to defray part of the cost, which means that since 20% are Enfield residents and 80% of the people come from surrounding towns, our share would be $30,000 and they would have to pay Enfield the other $120,000. If so, was there a response? If not, why don't we do it before the March 31st closure date? The Finance Department and the auditor should be commended for completing the fiscal year 2019 annual audit report seven days earlier than last year. I hope the Town Council takes the time to read all 144 pages of the report and especially the notes to the financial statements starting on page 25 and the statistics in tables 15, 16, and 17 on, pages one on page 115 as you begin asking questions regarding the budget preparation for 2021. I did pick up my copy this afternoon, so I have some questions. Well, this is the spring that we've been waiting for to finally complete the $36 million voter-approved upgrade to the water pollution control plant. It was noted that the town did receive the monies owed from the state of Connecticut based on the Department of Corrections agreement of $2.5 million, as noted in the audit report. That was welcome news. Hopefully when the other temporary loans are converted to long-term basis, the interest rates will not exceed the 2% rate that we have to pay for the debt. In reviewing page 74 of the audit report, I believe the WPC fund balance has gone from a negative balance of $2.544 million to a negative $3.649 million as of June 30, 2019. The net change in the negative fund balance was $1.1 million. The rates that we paid in fiscal 2019, 2019 were increased to offset the anticipated expenditures. It appears that there was a $300,000 that did not get transferred from the WPC as scheduled in 2019, which would have made the deficit worse. Is this the monies that were supposed to be repaid to the town for the advances given to the WPC? The audit report does indicate that the rates were structured to pay back the general fund $300,000 per year over a 10-year period. However, when I look at the 2020 budget, it appears that only $250,000 will be scheduled to be paid back in this coming period. Are we on track to pay this back in 10 years? The WPC revenues from customers increased in the past year from $4.516 million in 2018 to $6.772 million in 2019. The budget in 2019 was $100,000 in revenue from property taxes, and the actual received was $351,000. What property taxes does the WPC get, and from where? The monies for charges for services was $100,000 more than budgeted for 2019, which was good. It was interesting to note that on page 116 of the audit report, the WPC processed in 2019 the largest average daily sewage treatment gallons in the last 10 years. The 10 million gallon per day capacity plant processed $6.2 million, million gallons per day, which is an increase of 
28.3 percent from 2018 and 35.3 percent increase from 2017. Perhaps there's an, an explanation that someone would like to give regarding this dramatic increase. On that page in the report, it would be meaningful if the statistics for the number of customers and the gallons billed were also shown. There has to be some correlation between the gallons coming in and the gallons going out since we are billed on the gallons coming in. I doubt the WPC is billing enough and we will be surprised by a rate increase more substantial than we have previously seen. Thank you Thank for you. now. Anyone else like speak for the council? Jack. Welcome. Jack Sheridan, 7 Buchanan Road. Um, I made a list. The first thing, recycling. We get the recycling thing in the mail. Seems like we're recycling less than ever. This, this, instead of putting what you can put in, it's what you can't put in, and the list is bigger. So I don't understand. There's, there's all kinds of things that it seems like it's changing, reversing. There's, there's going to be more refuge than recycling. Um, the other thing I had was the transfer station. 600,000 for the scales. I understand the scales, you know, every once in a while the scale goes down and I'm told that people get online and tell them, hey, the scale's down, you can have some free dumping period. Well, big, big deal. I'd rather have a few tax paying residents get a free dump than to pay $600,000 for another scale. And a scale, don't shake your head and the, the, the $600,000 for a scale, and then uh, calibration charges for the scale. There's no linear calibration on the scale. They put one weight on and check it. So I don't know who thinks they're calibrating it and why they're paying so much money to do that. Um, water pollution control. Uh, I agree with Donna. How about that, Donna? Don't fall off your chair. <laughs> I agree with Donna that, you know, it should stay where it is. And maybe if we need to hire Karen LaPlante as a consultant or something like that, but with a new, uh, what is he, a director now that we hired for that position? Uh, I don't see any reason why, and so I'm agreeing with you, Donna. Um, I call him like I see him. Um, the... Uh, Fiduciary, I haven't heard any reports on the money that we gave the players from the Playhouse. So I'm wondering what the status of that is. Somebody was supposed to be reporting back to you guys on, on where that money is going. I see they're still not in the place, so. Um, and uh, <coughs> And field play. Oh, the school budget. You know, we look at almost everything in town by the people that use it. What people are we actually affecting and who, how many people are benefiting from these things? I talked to a couple of the exchange students in our schools, and they don't have extracurricular. They focus on academics. And until we can get our academics up to the point where the grades are such that we can cut our budget by the state statute, which says that you can cut the budget as long as the academics reach that goal, then that's what we should be focusing on. We shouldn't be focusing on all the extracurricular stuff when they don't do it in the other successful schools where academics are being met. So to me, it's a huge amount of money what business, I keep saying this, but what business can continue to reduce their customer base? There's fewer students every year for the past 20 years, and yet the school budget keeps going up. We close schools, they're vacant, and the budget still goes up. No business could continue to go like that. And the reason that you have to focus on where the money is going and, and focus on 
what the problem is. If we can use that state statute to lower the budget, then we should concentrate on academics. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. Anyone else like to speak with the council this time? Anyone else? Lucian. Welcome, sir. Lucian Lefebvre, 54 Kimberly Drive. Also Commander, American Legion Post 154. Just I want to put out a save the date, February 9th at 11 o'clock. We're having our 70th annual Four Chaplains Mass at St. Patrick's Church in Enfield here. And it's to celebrate the loss of the four chaplains that went down with the USAT Dorchester, which was between Newfoundland and Greenland, on the evening of February 2nd, 1943. The four Army cha chaplains gave up their life vests to give to other people to save themselves and console the ones that were still on a ship that went down with the ship. Out of the 902 men aboard, 672 died and 230 survived. So again, this is our 70th annual Four Chaplains Mass. And the chaplains that went down with the ship were uh, Army chaplains, Lieutenant George L. Fox, a Methodist, Lieutenant Alexander Goody, a Jewish rabbi, Lieutenant John P. Washington, Roman Catholic priest, and Lieutenant Clark V. Poling, a Dutch reformer. And as in the past, we have a member of the Board of Trustees from the Chapel of the Four Chaplains in the Navy Yard in Philadelphia coming up to do the narration for the Four Chaplains. And there is a luncheon in the church basement afterwards. So, you know, as many people as we can get there, we would love to see them. And again, we have most of the veterans organizations, some from in town, out of town, come in, post their organizational colors up front and it's to celebrate the uh, four chaplains that gave up their lives to save others in World War II. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. No one else like to speak to council at this time? Marie. Oh, wrong one. I'll slide it over. Welcome. Good evening and Happy New Year. I'm talking about something different tonight. I'm talking about the Enfield Mall. And I know that the council has no decision in what happens at the PNZ meeting this Thursday. But I would like to just remind people what the Enfield Mall did. Like many of you, you remember when the square opened on our town, it brought a new beginning. And it brought a job to me, an anxious 16-year-old. I worked at G Fox there, and I felt like I was on top of the world. But we all know the days of the big box stores are gone and e-commerce e has taken over. Our shopping malls are vacant, and our mall demonstrates that. The plan that the current owners are proposing is not what I envisioned for our mall. We need to look at what other communities are doing to develop their former malls. This space, in my opinion, should be a multi-use. It should offer residential, medical, entertainment, dining, and shopping. The space can offer something for everyone, and with easy access off 91, I believe it would attract new businesses and become a destination to our surrounding towns. Wouldn't it be nice to look off the highway and see some of that parking lot turned into green space? Space for parks, outside dining, walking paths, I understand that the new owners are looking to divide up this space and sell it off into parcels. I don't believe this is good for Enfield. I understand that the legal issues that zoning must look at, but I am encouraging our commissioners and our staff to investigate our toolbox and find a way to stop this proposal from happening. This mall sits right in the middle of our town's redevelopment plan. Please take a long, hard look at the future of this property. Your decision will impact our future development. And I'm also asking the current owners to work with our town to make this once beautiful property beautiful again. And again, I understand none of you have any decision in this. But what I'm talking to are the people watching. If you are watching this tonight and you don't have that vision of cutting up this mall, 
but you have a vision, come and share it at the PNZ meeting this Thursday. Come and let people know what you want that mall to be. This is our town. And I honestly believe that if, what, if this proposal goes through, it will stifle the hard work that we've done towards redeveloping. So again, I encourage people to come to Planning and Zoning at 7 p.m. this Thursday for the public hearing. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Anyone else like to speak for counsel this time? For the first time? For the second time? Ms. Sullivan. Gina Sullivan, 11 Spear Avenue, just wanted to finish where I left off. You encourage people to stay in this town, raise their families here, and yet take away a viable program that helps with caregiving for, for aging parents or relatives. Guess what? Aging is a part of life's journey. And just because you have not experienced it yet, or no longer need it, does not mean it's not still important. Councillor Mangini, Sakala, and Kiner, thank you for your continued support of this program. Thank you as well to former councillors Crisati, Davis, and Denny, as they were also strong advocates for this program. Shame on all of you. <coughs> Councillor Bosco, Ungeyer, <coughs> Muller, Deputy Mayor Suzak, <coughs> Mayor Ludwig, Councillor Sferaza, Councillor Riley for voting to close the Enfield Day Center program. You lied to the voters about the time frame, and you should be ashamed. Speaking of ashamed, I am very ashamed to say I live in a town with this type of leadership that cares so little about our most valuable, vulnerable, I'm sorry, vulnerable residents. Thank you for your time. Have a great night and a great 2020. Thank you. Thank you. I'd also like to speak for the council for the second time. Mr. Young? George Young, Holly Lane, Enfield. Uh, there are many questions that the council should be asking when the new budget discussions come up, and there should be no business as usual answers from the department heads. Look back at the last three years of the statist statistics on page 115 of the audit report and ask why the social services has gone from 53 people to 68 employees when the senior center was moved to the budget for the library. Why does the library have 25 employees now when only three of them are from the senior center and they had only 18 employees three years ago? The number of volumes in collection has decreased by 26,000 in the past 10 years, and the total volumes borrowed has decreased in astounding 163,000 volumes. In 2019, there were only 19 library employees. That statistical information is on page 115 of the audit report. Uh, Jack is right on some of the things he said about the recycling. On page 116 of the audit report, the refuse collected has decreased from 66 tons per day to 57 tons per day, and the recyclables have decreased from 17 tons per day to 15 tons per day. But you will notice that the number of employees remains the same at 20 full-time equivalent. There should be an explanation for the decrease in the tonnage. Is it a loss of population, or have we stopped recycling? These may all be the correct right number of employees, et cetera, but in order to reduce spending, you need to know why for the justification of the proposed new budget. A dollar saved in expense is like having to figure out how to raise another dollar in revenue from the taxpayers. You may not get the credit you deserve from saving the expense, but you know that raising the mill rate will get immediate attention. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Anyone else? Jack? Jack Sheridan, 7 Buchanan Road. Welcome. I, um, in my scribbles, I skipped over a few things. Uh, 
One thing I wanted to bring up is the lights on the police cars. They are so bright that they are blinding. When you try to go by those things in an accident that night, they're blinding. What happened to the days when you had a couple of blinking lights on the car and now we've got who knows how many thousands of dollars. I know they're expensive. Um, why do we have so many lights on the cars? And I really do think it's a danger. Um, and the other thing is, I, I wanted to hit on the percentage of students that actually utilize the extracurricular. Because the percentage is quite small. Back when we went over the numbers, uh, that a lot of the students that use them are repetitive names. But there's not as many kids utilizing those things as, as would justify the millions of dollars that we spend on the fields and all of the other things. And, and don't get me wrong, if the academics were where they needed to be, where we could cut the budget, then spend it on the extracurricular. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. Anyone else like to speak for the council? One more. Anyone else? I declare the public communications closed. Move on to item eight, councilor communications. Councilwoman Mangini. Thank you. Thank you, Lucian, for bringing forward the information, <clears throat> excuse me, about the four chaplains. I was um, honored uh, in, the, in the past on the council to be able to attend. It is a beautiful, beautiful ceremony uh, honoring those gentlemen, and I hope um, to be able to attend this time. So thank you for bringing that forward. Um, the other comment I just want to make are children and buses. I have observed, um, especially in the Raffia Road area, those little side streets, in the morning, um, many cars that are traveling very fast, I know, above the speed limit. And oftentimes, they will come very close to not stopping for the bus. And I think at this time, we need to be reminded that safety first. I don't care if you're late for your job, leave earlier. But I think it's important that we bring this forward because, you know, these are our kids and we really need to start paying attention. Thank you. Thank you. No one else? Council, Councilwoman Ungar? I just wanted to report I attended the Commission on Aging meeting last month. Uh, they're working on the blue book for the seniors and for those that don't know what the blue book is It's a community resource book with all kinds of information that would be important to a senior such as health care Physical assistance financial security transportation things like that uh, They're doing the finishing touches and uh, They're going to update everything because it's been a while since it's been really printed and re-released and updated So that really needed to get done uh, the proofs will be reviewed in early March and then after that they're going to distribute them Thank you Councilman Bosco the deputy mayor Suzak Yeah, I uh, just want to comment through the mayor to town manager uh, On Jack with the trash uh, and recycling numbers. Can we get? some kind of uh report on why and if the trash is going up and the recyclables are going down i mean this way we have it for when we finish up our uh, our solid waste ordinance it'd be nice to know if if people aren't putting out their recyclables it's that much more reason to do what we got to do uh jack scale no way i agree with you 100 percent the reasons why it was down was lightning strikes so if you lightning strike one of them you're going to lightning strike two of them. It's going to cost that much more to fix them. I agree with you. Unless they can show me something that is down outright where you can't uh, not do it, I'd be fighting that scale till as long as I'm sitting here. Uh, they do need a, a clean, safe building. They don't need something with showers. It is not an OSHA requirement. I checked. Um, they're, they, they need a safe building, they need a place that they can eat their food, wash their hands, and, and have a safe thing. So, uh, in my opinion, that was built to stay right underneath the charter. And, and it, it almost insults me in what, that, what they did up there uh, for a price. Um, so, that's where that's at. Lou, I thought, I thought Pam was coming today to see what's going on. 
you know, to explain that, you know, maybe after the end you could come and explain the twofer de uh, deal. So maybe they can, you know, sell some more, uh, some more REITs. Okay, I'll get back up. All right, that's it. Deputy Mayor Suzak, Council Sparazza, then Councilor Hamler. First of all, I'd like to say thank you for finally putting the new windows in. There's a big difference sitting up here, having new windows behind the curtain. I don't know. I, I know. Never felt them over here. I know. It's, and I think that we need clarification. We all know you don't want two scales, but let's not blow it out of proportion. The scale was like eighty-seven thousand dollars or seventy-eight thousand dollars. It was not six hundred thousand dollars for a scale. So, I, I hate misinformation. I, you know, let's. You know, discuss these things in a f rational fashion. It needs to be fixed. Whether we go to two scales or we go to one scale, we still need to fix that facility. Absolutely. It is deplorable. So the question on the table is how do we do that so that it's acceptable? And the other thing is, yes, it's under the referendum limit, but the numbers were from 2014. and. You know, the cost started there. All we did was escalate them at 4%, which is standard construction practices. And as opposed to referendums, everybody out there in TV land needs to understand that any kind of repair, maintenance, any CIP project that is over, I don't know, the number's a moving target for me, let's say $700,000, it has to go to referendum. It isn't that we want it to go to referendum, it has to go to referendum. And when you think that it's a choice that you don't want to do it, you know, we we know there's a problem. We're not coming out with referendums because there's not a problem. So I think people need to conscientiously understand how the charter is set up and why we go out to referendum. And don't just go in there and think because you have the ability to vote no that that really is the best choice for Enfield. Um, and I'm going to take care of a little business now. The motion to suspend the rules and move items E, F, G, and H to miscellaneous and proceed to vote. Second. Motion to suspend the rules made by Deputy Mayor Suzak, seconded by Councilor Muller. Any discussion on the motion? Hearing none by show of hands, all those in favor? Opposed, abstentions, 11 in favor, zero against. All set? Councilor Sparaza, then Councilor Hemler. Anyone else? Go ahead. So, um, Mr. Sheridan, I just wanted to address the, the police question you posed. Um, I think if you go back and research how officers lose their life and get hurt, believe it or not, car accidents are a major cause. And when they pull a car over on the side of a road, especially if it's not a well-lit road, um, the people in the car don't always sit in the car. Sometimes they jump out of the car and they're all of a sudden they're in the travel portion of the lane, let alone the liability if anyone gets hit. But it's truly an officer safety issue to make sure that drivers see the lights and as the law provides, move over. You're right, it is a little blinding momentarily. <laughs> But the lights that we're using in town are standard. They're not any different than what you'd find anywhere else. And like I said, it's for officer safety to make sure people slow down, move over to the left, because you don't know when that car is stopped, if the person's just gonna sit in that car, they gotta jump out and run into traffic. And you know, I, I think back when we lost the, it wasn't the same situation, but the state trooper up on the highway in Enfield, where he was way over into the right lane with his lights on and he got plowed in and killed. So um, I think that's the reason the lights are, are that bright. I don't disagree with you though. If you're just driving, they, they kind of blind you a little bit, but hopefully you see them you, when you can move over and it's just an officer safety thing. That's all, Jack. Well, if you move over, that's supposed to help mediate that, but that's the reason, so. Councilor Hamler. Um, <clears throat> on January 9th at 6.30, there's a program uh, in town. It's called uh, Poetry in Enfield. It's gonna be at Enfield High School. It's students grades six to 12, and they'll be reciting their poems, and um, I'm hoping that everyone will consider coming to support our young folks. Um, the coach, cars, Cultural Arts Commission, sorry, 
um, have some events at the um, Central Library. Uh, January 24th, Music Together. It's a class for kids, uh, birth to five years old. No registration needed. Um, later in the month, the Friends of the Library are having an automatic door opening installed in the rear entrance uh, to increase accessibility. And uh, they uh, just wanted to let everybody know that there, um, that there was a library book club that was uh, increased in attendance because it was moved to the senior center. Um, as far as the veterans, uh, Lucian, I do plan to event uh, to do plan to um, to come to the event. It sounds great. And uh, the Economic Development Commission, uh, I went to their meeting, and they're working on some great ideas to energize businesses in Enfield. Councilor Muller. Through the mayor to the town manager, could you let the register of voters know that we're starting construction on JFK uh, April break? So I'm not sure how that's going to affect November with the election for the coming years. We won't finish until October 2022. Well, they're here, so I think you delivered Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Anyone else? I just two quick things. For uh, I just want to thank in advance and thank everyone who's actually helped their neighbor with shoveling. Snow blowing, I, I see it all over town. Keep up the good work by helping your neighbor, when, especially with some of the heavier snow and ice we've had so far this year. And also want to thank all the businesses, and there's a numerous ones, who stepped up and sponsored the girls' basketball tournament, the holiday tournament that's been going for a number of years. You know, when they lost their initial sp sponsor, the tournament went on, it was successful over the weekend. So again, as always, our corporate partners step up and when they need, and they, they always do a great job. Moving on to item nine, town manager report. Uh, good evening, Mr. Mayor and Councilors. Uh, before we get to our report on the uh, tree trimming, I'd just like to uh, do a couple follow-ups that the Council had asked me to pursue um, in regard to the adult daycare closure. Uh, number one, we are uh, currently talking um, our social service workers, uh, uh, clients and families. There has been some question about offsetting and defraying some costs that they may experience with the closure uh, by the date of March 30th, in particular transportation. So our staff is reaching out uh, in regard to that because council has said they'd like to set some of those monies aside to help those individuals that are currently at the uh, facility to offset those costs um, through the inconvenience of the closure. So we're working towards that. Most of it seems to revolve around transportation. Also, we have spoken, reached out to the other two facilities we spoke to previously, um, the Felician sisters who are dealing directly with the patients also in Windsor where they are thinking of providing some transportation if we can get our um, current clients to the senior center so we'll have and we'll flesh that out for the next meeting um, also as the council had said it was their intention um, to allocate and use the funding that would be derived from the closure uh, this year um, from the adult daycare and also uh, assess it in the next budget year. So we've been looking, some of the suggestions that have come forward are in the area of need of seniors in regard to really uh, navigating through the morass of programs such as Medicare and, and Medicaid and different uh, from the circuit breaker program, elderly tax credits with the state and federal government. It really is a labyrinth which is difficult for them to uh, undertake alone. So our director, Cindy Guerreri, has been looking. Um, she's going to be recommending for your approval, we'll bring her in at the next meeting, but for a geriatric uh, care manager, that's the parlance that they use, somebody would help them with looking at screenings, working with all other agencies, state and federal, to assist them within the town and be the representative, a focal point, so it's centralized. So that's where a person could go with their family that's a senior um, to help with all of the different services that they might need or be aware of or not aware of state and federal. So I think that's a good use of our funds. Nationally, the cost of that uh, with benefits is about $65,000, well within the money that we had allocated yearly towards the program, which has been discussed previously. So I know the council was uh, anxious to let our residents know that they want to reinvest that money into our senior population and make services available to that same group of people on a broader scale. So we'll flesh that out for you and have that at the next meeting. And with that, if there are no questions, we don't have a PAR report this evening. I would... Uh, any questions? Carl? Yeah. Um, Chris, just a couple of things. I know next month, I believe, we're going to have a presentation from um, someone from social services on the circuit breaker. Well, Del 
excuse me, Dell actually administers it with John Wilcox from okay. Tax Assessment and Finance. Okay. They'll be here with And sometimes it's also called a, a tax relief uh, program. So I know they're going to get into all the details, but, uh, you know, clearly this is a program for everyone to understand that for years the state of Connecticut <laughs> contributed towards. And a couple of years ago they said, we don't have the funds, we're not doing it. And I don't have the exact numbers, but I'm thinking it's four to 600 families each year participate in this uh, circuit breaker program. If you're 65 years old or older, your income level is a certain amount or you're disabled, you can apply for a tax credit. A lot of these folks are on fixed incomes, they're seniors, $500, $1,000 is a lot of money. Um, I certainly would support, as the council has in the past, to fund this whole thing. If the state's not going to step up, it's shame on them for not, then I think we should. And I look forward, Chris, to that presentation uh, from Della. Um, and the other thing is, too, what you just mentioned about the geriatric care manager. Um, you know, there are a myriad of things as people age besides dementia, you know, energy assistance, uh, tax relief. I think it would be just outstanding if someone from the town could be the point person, and if it's going to be this person, great, to help our seniors navigate all the different programs that are available to them. And I think that's, uh, you know, speaking just for myself, I mean, we need to know more about how it's going to be put together, but I, I love the concept of someone dedicated to helping our aged population. Well, I think it's only being receptive and cognizant of our changing environment. You know, in, in town government, I think sometimes we're accused, and on all levels of government for that matter, of being static, of not looking at change and being adaptable to it. You know, last year in our budget, we made significant changes. We eliminated positions because we thought they were no longer necessary. Um, some of them, you know, eighty, ninety thousand dollars a year, and it's a difficult thing to do. We try to, um, you know, put people in other jobs if we're if we're if, we're, if it's possible, but we have to look at the bottom line and look at the taxpayers and the mill rate, frankly, to make sure people can afford to live here. We did last year in one position, we eliminated and created three or four others, which have been usually productive and successful in the area of blight enforcement and safety, which then has reduced our workman's compensation costs because our workers are safe, our, our, our uh, workplace is safer, and also residents visiting the town. We, we can ensure that they have a safe place to come to. So we're trying to be responsive and adaptive, and I think this is an area where this is a need. We have an aging population, we have a large senior population in the town, and it's something we've heard and even from one of the family members, as distraught as she was talking about the, the care at the adult daycare, she mentioned this. And I think the council, and we, I've heard it echoed in the past from other residents, so we're trying to address it. And by saving those other positions, we're going to be changing this year. I'm going to recommend in the budget. And I think so we're trying to be adaptive and we're trying to respond to current needs. Um, so we're just not doing the same thing, as Mr. Young said, over and over and over again, because times are changing. and clear Clearly, there's less state and federal money, and we've got to be responsive to the taxpayers. I'll just tell you, in regard to the elderly tax credit, basically that's a two-pronged program. The state supplies and mandates that we provide about $300,000 for it. We passed a local ordinance which said we'll, we'll reciprocate and match of $300,000. Now, the last two years, the council was very clear. We actually sent letters out to the recipients of that of funding to say, you know, beware, because as we know, two years ago, uh, we were ravaged by the cuts. Um, from the governor uh, to our state budget, and it was it was unclear if we could provide that assistance. And it is a lot of money, uh, Mr. Sfraza, and I'll tell you specifically, on the town share last year, we provided over $305,000 matching, which we, we didn't have to do. The council could have said, um, times are too tight, but they, they kept the promise and they did it. And that that matching grant helped 500 families in this town. So it's, it'll be in my budget again this year. I'm not recommending that we send any letters out of caution saying it may be eliminated because I don't think hopefully, um, even though the governor's talking today about certain cuts and we've talked to legislators today about it's still an uncertain future out there. There is a deficit. We're trying to tighten our belt. I said that last year, just because you have a temporary time that looks like you know things are going well federally, we have to be prepared um, to be able to make some um, serious decisions in this upcoming budget because, you know, unless we change things in Connecticut, we just saw we're the fourth state on the list of out-migration. The movers are really busy in Connecticut, and we've got to try to stop that hemorrhaging. But until we do, we better tighten our belts. So all of these things have to be looked at anew each and every year with a fresh set of eyes, and we're going to be doing that in this budget very aggressively. And, and you know, Chris, I, I'm still, I still remain skeptical uh, when I look at the state pension deficit 
approaching $100 billion that come next, this March or April, the state's not to say, oh, you know what, we calculated wrong. I guess we have a deficit. We're going to cut some municipal aid. And you know what? There's two competing things here. People don't want to pay more tax. I get that. I also get that if you're on a fixed income, you're not getting big increases in pension. Social Security's not going up that much. And if you can get $500, you know, that, that's groceries for people. It's important. So that's why anything we can do to further this is, is a good thing. So thank and you. And they'll be here next, the next meeting or the first meeting in February. Chris, curious, just one question before we get to the tree trimming. I know you meet with the fire chiefs periodically. Just curious on any, I read the report that they're delaying, that the report on the consolidation will be, re, will, won't go out till springtime, I believe. I had I seen that curious. same press report. Yeah. I don't have any knowledge, but it, I will make an inquiry with the next meeting if you would like me to on behalf of the yeah, council. Yeah, just curious. I mean, certainly I'm one that very curious on if you know, I applaud them for looking into consolidation because I think it's something they should be doing. All right, I'll make yeah. the inquiry. Appreciate it. So, without further ado, what you've all come for this evening, what you're all waiting for, is the tree trimming program. So I'll invite up, I don't know if Donald's going to come up, and we have our uh, subcontractor and our Eversource representative here as well, telling us how they're trimming to keep the power lines humming in Enfield. Welcome, sir. So I'm just going to give a brief introduction. Kevin Wittkos is behind me from Eversource and Barrel Levangie. We'll give a... Do you, you folks want to come up, or your call? Okay. You're welcome. So you're welcome to come up. And I gave this presentation last year because we couldn't get them to come. So I, I kind of gave what, what's going to happen, you know, what happened last year for all the tree trimming. So this year they are here and they will do the presentation and I will quietly walk backwards. And, and I'd like to share. just hasten to add, all of these presentations are on the town manager's website, the slideshows. What we most recently did is we edited from the, uh, town, the full town council meetings. And now these presentations with uh, speakers such as Kevin and our uh, guest here, they citizens can watch the whole presentation so they now will be able to hear what they have to say in addition to the uh, presentation that they present so I think it's just a much more fulsome um, review we've had a lot of people looking we have a, a good library of special um, visits and reports we have on there and this will be up there tomorrow in both contexts so I just wanted to add that for those at home who may want to watch last year's and tell their friends about this one Thank you. P thank you for coming. Welcome. And if you wouldn't mind, just name and title, and the floor is yours. Mm -hmm. Kevin, go ahead. Well, good evening, everyone. My name is Kevin Wickos. I'm the Community Relations Specialist for uh, numerous towns in Connecticut, but Enfield is one of the uh, towns that I am responsible for. In, in my role as a Community Relations Specialist, I'd like to say I provide a concierge-level service to the municipality. So I have police chief, fire chief, town managers, public works director. Uh, they basically call me, and I run around Eversource and try to connect you to the right people, get the right answers. Um, and part of that job tonight is uh, our vegetation management uh, group that is responsible for tree trimming. And uh, Bear is with us this evening to go over the, her program as to how often we uh, go out we're trimming uh, our lines and to what specifications that we do that. Excellent. Hello, everybody. My name is Bear Levanji. I'm an arborist for the Eversource for the Tallinn and Hartford area. Uh, this program is, uh, albeit brief, but very detailed. So if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to ask. Uh, this year for 2020, these are going to be the circuits that we're going to be trimming and basically the specifications of what that looks like. So on the 23rd, we met with Donald Noons. Uh, thank you very much, Donald. Um, to basically go over the work, um, our contractor are, is Aspen Tree Experts, LLC, and they'll be staging their equipment across from the dog park at the transfer station. Uh, they will not be refueling or performing repairs at the transfer station, and they'll have approximately 10 bucket trucks and chippers with each three-person crews. They will follow the current town excavation permit policy regarding traffic control and use of off-duty officers, and Eversource contractor Aspen Tree Experts will go door to door requesting a consent signed uh, from each resident for the proposed tree work for each property. There is no cost to the resident or the town and the total trimming for 2020 for complete miles is 79.27 miles. This is the town map of the circuits that we will be trimming and I'm, I'm not sure if the homeowners can actually see or the people that are watching television can see the colors but at the small little red spots are the enhanced tree trimming. The dark blue or navy blue is the backbone maintenance trimming. And the green is the scheduled maintenance trimming. And the little square block is the substation. And the town boundary is the absolute uh, 
section around the border there. So this is the pamphlet that homeowners or property owners will receive. Uh, it's actually two-sided, so it's a tri-fold. Uh, there's a lot of information on this, so when you do get this, please take the time to look at it and review it. And this is the inside, oops, excuse me. This is the inside of the pamphlet, which basically talks about the customer benefits of why we trim, the critical trimming about what that actually means, um, talks about the clearance specifications, it talks, talks about risk trees, and our constant um, striving for re increasing reliability for our lines. Could you explain what the pictures are? That I will. Info. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Thank you. So uh, for the last little brochure, this is a blow up of each one of those pictures. So for scheduled maintenance trimming, which was the green line on the, the large town map, um, above each utility line is 15 feet above, 10 feet below, and 8 feet to the side. And tall, green, excuse me, tall growing trees under the wires are selectively removed. Branches are pruned to the ANSI A300 standards to reduce harm and limit resprouting. For the scheduled maintenance trimming, there's 54.18 miles. For backbone maintenance trimming, it's eight feet to the side of the electrical, the outer, excuse me, the outermost um, line to the tree from the ground to the sky. Higher priority tree trimming impacts more customers, so that's why it's called backbone. Tall growing trees under the wires will be removed, and branches are pruned to the A300 standards to reduce harm and, and resprouting again. Backbone maintenance trimming is scheduled to be 24.05 miles. And then enhanced tree trimming is cut eight feet from the electrical equipment from the ground to the sky, and higher priority tree trimming impacts more customers. So that would be more schools and hospitals, town buildings, municipal areas, um, anything with a larger customer impact count. Uh, removal of all tall growing trees under the wires, and again, branches pruned to ANSI A300 to reduce harm and limit resprouting, and that'll equate to 1.04 miles. Again, this is another type of the notica notification. It's just a little bit uh, larger image. And there'll be door hangers. So if the homeowners are not home, this, this notification will be left at their door. And then the, the actual trifold pamphlet as well. This is a um, insert that will go into that trifold where the customer will actually fill out the date, uh, the property location, the town, uh, the and the planner will fill out the circuit number and on this information you'll notice that there's uh, the description of the work being proposed and whether the homeowner agrees or wants a modification or objects. There'll be the information for the planner written in there as well and so they can contact the planner directly. So uh, Asplen must c notify each tree, uh, tree owner or property owner and the residents are required to sign this, this form for notification and if they would like to keep the wood, they're more than welcome to keep the wood. Uh, this is a, the permit that the Eversource and towns sign collaboratively to basically grant work per permitted each year. And how the tree work is performed, again, backbone or a higher population density takes priority. Decay infested trees. Um, insect infested, damaged or structurally weak trees will be removed. Small trees and saplings growing, capable of growing into the conductors are normally removed before they're tall enough to make contact because once they make contact they can cause outages. Limbs are pruned back to the branch collar to prevent decay from pruning wood, excuse me, of pruning wood. And branches up to 15 inches diameter shall be chipped during scheduled work. Larger logs are stockpiled for future pickup within two to six weeks, depending on the amount of work <coughs> in that circuit. This is my contact information at the top, and the two planners for this year's work is Alden Bianchi and John Kuznicki. And should you have any questions? Thank you. Any yeah. questions? Thank you. Councilor Riley. Um, now, look at the map. I can't really see that far away. Yep. Sorry. Looking at the map, I can't really I'll go back see. To the, yeah. um, but it looks like a lot of District 4 is in there, which is a good thing because last time in the windstorm, District 4 got hammered pretty good. Um, so is there a way that uh, it can be put up on the website or a list of streets that are being done be provided? 
Sure. So that we know which ones are being done. Sure. All right. Cool. Thank Excellent. you. Thank you. Councilor Kiner. Thank you. Uh, what recourse do property owners have if they want to contest the removal of the tree? If it's a town tree, they talk to their tree warden. If it's um, if it's their own tree, if it's on their property, yeah, yeah they they can absolutely refuse re uh, removal. Um, it's basically a discussion, though. So if it's a threat to the lines and the tree is damaged or inf infested of any sort of insect damage or it's structurally weak. Um, I, I basically will have a conversation with the homeowner to basically to talk about the health of the tree and why it should be removed. If the tree is healthy, we don't have to remove it. Now, if the homeowner still contests and wants to keep the tree, what happens? Uh, they're more than welcome to, but I would highly suggest not doing that because if the tree falls, it's going to take the lines down and create a massive safety hazard for homeowners and neighbors and also changes the reliability for everybody around them. So if their tree does fall on the lines, all of their neighbors are going to go out and everybody on that circuit. So, so as a last resort, you would go along with what the, uh, what the owner said. If the owner does not want the tree down, the tree doesn't come down. Is that right? Yeah, unfortunately. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Councilor Sparazza, then Councilor Longo. Just a quick question, kind of peripherally related to this. <laughs> When we have prolonged outages, mm -hmm. I know we have our emergency operations center, and over the years, when I was with the PD, you would send a representative into our EOC during the, the storm. Do you still do that? Yeah, that remains an option if um, Steve Hall, your emergency management director, right. calls and says, our EOC is open, we'd like to have a liaison come physically to our uh, emergency operations center, we'll do that. Uh, we've changed our model a little bit. We prefer to keep those persons in-house if available. If, uh, uh, but remain in constant contact with uh, your facility because we, we feel that if they're housed in our building where our operations center is, they can walk down the hallway real quick and probably get an answer directly from the person that's making the decisions as to when a crew's coming, you know, what are we looking at for restoration times, then trying to call in on the phone and waiting for somebody. Um, but if a town demands somebody to be there, they'll be there. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. How's the wrong guy? I was wondering, who is the actual tree warden? <laughs> Donald Ward. <laughs> Donald uh, just took his test and he slam dunked it and he's the tree warden. Sorry, I didn't know. You wear many hats. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else? Deputy Mayor Suzak. I just have a question. On, we had that large outage on Beverly, that last storm, um, and the, the neighborhood was out for almost a week. Now, the tree that caused that was in the middle of somebody's front yard. So, it does, you know, and it didn't look like many trees were trimmed in that area anyway. As I went down Beverly and the surrounding area, I don't know if how, when the trees were last trimmed off of Hazard Avenue. So, I guess, what was the final outcome with that? Because I sent somebody out there because the tree was, you know, split in two and it looked like the next, the next time it was going over, it was going to take the rest of the lines. How was something like that resolved? Did the, did the owner have to take that tree down? I don't remember what I... I know Donald did follow up by if he wants to respond um, or if he wants to send information. I know we had a back and forth on that. I think part of the problem is is what Bear had said. You know, you have a resident. This is the who, danger of leaving a tree yeah. that that's. And it, we can't compel them to do it. And unfortunately, then if you have an untoward result, not only do you have the outage, but then they may have responsibility for any uh, right. personal injury or property damage to others. But I think we don't have the ability, and these are the experts, and Donald's the tree warden, to compel them to take down a tree. I, it would take a court action. It really would be, you know, it's the type of thing in, in this country that there can't be a taking without due process. So. Yeah. Um, there would have to be, I imagine, we have a new town attorney. He'll be up here next time. He can give us the answer. Uh, I won't put him on the spot as to what that procedure would be, but yeah, we looked into it, and it was a private matter when it was all right, said and done. You, Correct, Donald? Yes. Right. It's you want actually people the, to be cognizant of the fact that when, you know, you know, when the tree needs to be trimmed or be removed, that potentially it could be a large expense to the owner who decides that they're not, they're going to waive this being done? 
No, I think it's a very it good point, It doesn't like go back on to Eversource for the no, responsibility. What, right. It transfers to the owner of the and tree. And, you know, I, I'm not speaking out of school. I know a lot of persons who want to have had larger trees removed. It's thousands and thousands of dollars. So if Eversource is there making an informed professional decision that, look, at this tree's sick or diseased, and you have the opportunity to have them do it at their cost, I'd avail myself of it. Because as you say, Donna, once they're gone and there's, a, a you know, an outage or, or damage or it falls on a car in the street, you, you're on your own. So I know some people, hey, some people have planted trees when they're little saplings or their grandfather did, and there is an emotional attachment. But hopefully you can differentiate between the two if you have a tree that does pose a risk to yourself, that your neighbors in the lines, to, to, to make the realistic decision. So hopefully, I know they have good people. They'll uh, have people like Bear's assistants, the arborist, to have the discussion and try to prevail upon people and, and have their better judgment prevail, hopefully. And if I can answer just a couple more of those questions. So you had asked about when what was trimmed last. Our circuits are trimmed every four years. Okay. okay. Um, and secondly, I would like to just um, reiterate, that, and this may sound, um, mm, for, the, for folks that own properties, they get very, very excited about the very first time that they sign that mortgage payment or that, that uh, deed. They get very excited about the property lines, and they own everything in that property line. There is a responsibility of the plants that are on your property. You do own those. So when you brought up to, thank you for bringing that up, because a lot of people love their trees immensely, as I do as well. Um, and I, at, every, at all costs, I try not to remove trees. But there are, trees should be planted in the right place. So depending on the species, depending on the size, depending on the health, depending on the, the, how fast it grows, the motto in the arboricultural world is right tree, right place. So if you plant a sugar maple that wants to be 110 feet tall and 100 feet canopy wide spread right under the lines, we will cut it down. <laughs> it's the wrong tree. And I would love, to, I would, if people would love an education about that, that would be great. We can talk about it in Arbor Day potentially with, with Mr. Noons. Um, he does a great job in this town. And I think a lot of people, like you said, they see this sapling or they got it at an Arbor Day program where you get 10 trees for a donation and they put it wherever they think it might be uh, best suited, but it's oftentimes not best suited. You know, we're going to take you up on that. We do special presentations. I think that would be a fascinating one. We'll work with Donald to bring you back and, and maybe do that tutorial for our residents and, again, put it up so when people are considering uh, shade trees or a fruit tree or whatever, um, your insight would really be helpful for them to put the right tree in the right place. So we'll take you up on that, Bear. Thank you. Thank you. So just curious, and last question, so to sections of town that did get, you know, or, or other towns maybe, maybe I'm filling some of the data, that you actually do cut, you know, the trees get trimmed. Is there data that shows, again, I mean, we have tr wind storms all the time, no matter what season, that that does actually help keep less, you lose power less. So, so meaning is there, you know, data that you can actually share? Because I, I think there, I, again, I'm just saying personally, I know there's a bunch of trees in our, in our area that got cut where, again, it, it, I mean, we do have some power outages, but not like it seemed a few years ago before, after the big storm and, you know, where it knocked down so many power lines. It seemed a lot more, I just, maybe I'm just using in general, and I apologize, but, you know, it seemed a lot more uh, frequent about five, six years ago as it is, is now in certain sections of town. So I'm okay. curious if you actually you have that data. We do have the data, yes. And um, part of that reliability also falls upon property owners refusing, refusing trimming. So if one of the planners comes to somebody's house and the, that customer refuses trimming, that's often the right. situation where we're getting outages. And so it's, about, it's that education constantly I think that would be about part of that presentation. I think it's important. And, and everyone wants to be a good neighbor. And, and, I, and I get that, the, you know, with trees, but if you have, that, you have that one neighbor where you have the main line and you're not willing to trim that tree that's hanging over, and then we get a storm tomorrow and everyone's out of power and freezing weather, I mean, there's got to be some reasonability and, and some, you know what I mean? And I think that's Absolutely. part of that. Because I think there is some data. And if you had, like, hey, look, in sections, even if it's outside of town where you've cut major trees in Tallinn or whatever, you've seen 2 or 3 percent less. Yeah, I'm mean, just saying, whatever the numbers may be. We do. And w what happens every four years is those circuits are then reevaluated. So for 2020, we have so many circuits that we're going to be trimming. Right. And the first ones that are trimmed are the ones with the worst reliability. Right. <laughs> And so, so, I, so I'm saying, I, the yeah. money that you guys invest in that, there's got to be a little bit of that ROI, for lack of a better word, on... May we have that information? We'll be more than happy to I'd provide be great. it to you. I think it would be actually the help when you have that conversation. As a whole, as right. to the reduction in your outages and the, and the duration of your outages right. have been reduced. I think it's, you know, it's real data for someone who may not want to remove a tree for whatever reason, but mm -hmm. 
and then tomorrow we get a storm that knocks it over. And, and if you're one of those properties that lose it or one of those trees fall, I mean, we've seen in town where that section, District 4, I mean, you know, some of those trees <laughs> fall right through people's, you know, garages and houses. Then that's a lar much larger problem than Absolutely. cutting some branches. Uh, you know what I mean? I mean, I think th that data is important. I guess I, that's my question to you guys. So it would be great to have that. You know, I think that would help, too, when you actually have maybe those situations. They may be rare. I don't know. You know. But I'm assuming some people may just say, you know what, don't cut my tree. But then that affects, obviously, not just you, but your neighbors as well. Right. 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 Yep. Yep. One last question. So what happens if the homeowner just doesn't fill out the form? Do you just then do the work? You keep we try again. We try <laughs> again. We try again. We just keep trying. Okay. Yep. Um, if the tree is in contact by law, by state statute, we can come and trim it, right. but it's called breaking contact. So we won't do a full specification. We'll just break. So if, uh, if I may, here's the tree branch and here's the wire and it's touching. We'll just take off the tips of the branches, uh, pruning back to the A300 standards that we're, uh, we abide by. Um, but we're trying to prevent a fire, basically. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? We obviously would love to have them come back. Um, we'll def Donald has a question. Sorry, go ahead, Donald. Yeah, I got a few more. Yeah. Okay. Oh, Kevin, yeah, you can stay here. Kevin, you can go. Oh. <laughs> Thank you, Kevin. <laughs> So I just want to talk about schedule, uh, which we didn't really talk about. So tomorrow I will issue the permit to Eversource to go start this work. So Asplund will be uh, eagerly, aggressively knocking on doors because they want to get started. Wintertime is the best time for this, uh, this operation. To Councillor Riley's concern, I will have this up before the end of the week. Uh, I'll have the map up and I'll have a list of streets um, that will that'll be up on our, on our website. Uh, it will be on DPW's, DPW's website. Thank you so much. And lastly, I just want to... Um, I just want to say, uh, Asplund, the last, the last round uh, really has stepped up when regarding um, the tree removal, the log removal. Now, again, as a, as a word of advice and caution to those homeowners who want the wood, they say they want the wood, but then when they leave a, a butt the size of this table, the size of this table on, and you realize they don't have a chainsaw to cut it, then they say we don't want it now and. They really got to think twice before they really accept that because, again, when they have all those forms, like, um, where is that? So when they sign that form, they're on the bottom, it says they agree to take the wood. So they leave, and we, then, we, then you folks call and say, you know, these, the, the wood's been laying there for a month, two months, and we had that problem a couple of years ago. Right. That's where some of that came in, that they can't, they can't re they realize how big those things are and they can't handle it. So again, it's just more of a, it's an advice thing to you know really make sure you can handle what's what's left. What, what I would request like a good we have, six to seven meeting in March. Well, for all the other reasons yeah. about where to plant, where not, but I would just ask you in, in talking to Asblon to to make that clear to people because I'm sure it's much easier for them to leave it. So if somebody says they want the wood, could they please? tell uh, the person what Donald just said that it uh, maybe they do bear okay but make sure that they are doing that so that you know we don't have the uh, buyer remorse afterwards right and again Asplund has added more trucks more log trucks to help clean up because then we had South Road we had a lot of logs that were out for a long time the last two 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 trimmings ago last year was, is, was a lot was considerably better and I want to get thank Eversource and Asplund for working with me to help to help do that so that it's not left out in an eyesore for too long so so possibly Marchish probably a good time to come back have this presentation if you uh, have the time we can celebrate Arbor Day perfect I think we should do it around then and Kevin yeah. has also said they yep. bring saplings and some other perfect. items that we could give to our residents to really make it it'd be a really inclusive and I think a be exciting event to do it around then so. We'll make the date, we'll work with our office, and we'll schedule it. Thank you both for coming. Yeah, thank you both for coming. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on to town attorney report. Since the seat is vacant, we'll move on to item 11, report of special committees. Council Muller? Yes, I have a JFK building committee update, uh, the architect's report. Uh, they're tightening the documents, the construction documents. They go to code review for the state of Connecticut on February 4th, 2020. And they're presenting to the board at the end of January. On January 28th, they will do a presentation to the Board of Education. They value engineered 34 items to stay within the 84 million. Uh, they're bid alternative, alternatives for unforeseen market conditions. Also, the CMR report, the bid packages they're preparing, uh, we're going to have roughly 37 to 40 bid packages for public procurement. Thank you. Anyone else? 
Councillor Riley. So Joint Facilities is going to meet this Thursday, and um, hopefully we'll have a better update from BNL about our um, consolidation of buildings and what the next steps are in our plan. Explain who BNL is for people. Oh, BNL is our um, contractor for. Um, they're basically putting the town. They're the architect putting the plan together under our direction. Anyone else? Moving on to item 12, old business. Item A1 stays on the table. Do I have a motion to remove item A2? Yes. Motion, motion made to remove from the table by Councilor Second. Muller, seconded by Councilor Riley. Any dis all those in favor of removing from the table? Opposed, abstentions? Ten in favor, zero against. Do I have a nomination? Please? Yes. John Ungeyer. Motion, uh, nomination made. Second. Seconded by Deputy Mayor Suzak. Motion, motion to close nominations by Deputy Mayor Suzak. Seconded Second. by Councilor Muller. All those in favor of closing nominations by a show of hands. Opposed, abstentions? Nine, I would have said nine in favor, one abstention. Yep. Nine in favor, one abstention. Any discussion on the main motion? Hearing none, roll call, please. Councilor Hemler. Four. Councilor Kiner. Four. Mayor Ludwig. Four. Councilor Mancini. John Ungar. Councilor Muller. Four. Councilor Riley. Four. Councilor Sferraza. Four. Deputy Mayor Suzak. John Ungar. Councilor Ungar. Abstain. Councilor Bosco is not here. And Councilor Sakala. John Ungar. We have nine in favor, one abstention. And again, Moving on to page two, no appointments from three to ten. We move on to uh, item 11, the Historic District Commission alternate. Do I have a motion to remove from the table? So by Deputy Mayor Suzak. Second. Seconded by Councilor Riley. All those in favor of moving from the table by show of hands. Opposed, abstentions, ten in favor, zero against. Do I have a nomination, please? Mm -hmm. Councilor Muller. Jacob Nadeau. Motion. Second. Seconded by Deputy Mayor Suzak. Do I have a motion to close nominations? So moved. Councilor Spraza, seconded by Councilor Sakala. All in favor of closing nominations by show of hands. Opposed, abstentions. Any discussion on the main motion? Hearing none, roll call, please. Councilor Hemler. Four. Councilor Kiner. Four. Mayor Ludwig. Four. Councilor Mancini. Jacob Nadu. Councilor Muller. Four. Councilor Riley. Four. Councilor Spraza. Four. Deputy Mayor Suzak. Jacob Nadu. Councillor Ungeyer. Four. Councillor Bosco, would you like to vote or we're voting for the historic district alternate, Jacob Nadu. Four. Councillor Sakala. Jacob Nadu. Eleven in favor, none against, no abstentions. Item A12 stays on the table. Item A13, Loan Review Committee. Do I have a motion to remove from the table? By Councillor Muller. Second. By Councillor Riley. All those in favor of moving from the table by show of hands. Opposed, abstentions, 11 in favor, zero against. Do we have a nomination, please? Councilor Muller. Deb Giddings. Uh, motion made. Second. Seconded by Councilor Riley. Do we have a motion to close nominations? By mm -hmm. Councilor Sakala, seconded by Deputy Mayor Suzak. All those in favor of closing nominations by show of hands. Opposed, abstentions, 11 in favor, zero against. Any discussion on the main motion? Hearing none, roll call, please. Councilor Hemler. Four. Councilor Kiner. Four. Mayor Ludwig. Four. Councillor Mangini. Deb Giddings. Councillor Muller. Four. Councillor Riley. Four. Councillor Sferraza. Four. Deputy Mayor Suzak. Deb Giddings. Councillor Ungeyer. Four. Councillor Bosco. Four. Councillor Sakala. Four. It's 11 in favor, none against, no abstentions. Items 14 through 16 stay on the table. Moving on to the top of page three, 17 and 18 again remain on the table. Uh, item B, town manager appointments, we have none. One through 12. Moving on to the top of page four, 13 through 17. Again, we have none. Uh, item C, appointments, PNZ commission appointed, council approved. Again, there are none. Item D, school roof replacements, stays on the table. Item 13, new business. There is no A consent agenda under item A. Item B, appointments. Items one, two, three, and four, again, remain on the table. Do I have a motion for um, item five, Planning and Zoning Commission? Yes, I, I would like I'll to make the motion, if I may, for um, reappointment for Mary Scott. Motion made. Second. By Councilor Sakala. Do, do I have a motion to close nominations? <coughs> by Ke Deputy Mayor Suzak, second by Councilor Muller. All those in favor of closing nominations by show of hands. 
Opposed? Abstentions? We have 11 favors, zero against. Any discussion on the main motion? Hearing none, roll call, please. Councillor Hemmler. Four. Councillor Kiner. Four. Mayor Ludwig. Four. Councillor Mangini. Oh, Mary Scott. Councillor Muller. Four. Councillor Riley. Mary Scott. Councillor Sarraza. Four. Deputy Mayor Suzak. Mary Scott. Councillor Ungeyer. Mary Scott. Councillor Bosco. Four. Councillor Sakala. Mary Scott. There's 11 in favor, none against, no abstentions. Item B6, Zoning Board of Appeals. Do I have a nomination? Yes. Go ahead. Charles Mastaberti. Uh, nominated by uh, Councillor Muller, second by Deputy Mayor Suzak. Do I have a motion to close nominations? No motion. By second. Deputy Mayor Suzak, second by Councillor Muller. All those in favor of closing nominations by show of hands. Opposed? Abstentions? 11 in favor, zero against. Do I have any discussion on the main motion? Hearing none, roll call, please. Councillor Hemmler. Four. Councillor Kiner. Four. Mayor Ludwig. Four. Councillor Mangini. Uh, Charles Masterberti. Councillor Muller. Four. Councillor Riley. Charles Masterberti. Councillor Sarraza. Four. Deputy Mayor Suzak. Charles Masterberti. Councillor Ungeyer. Four. Councillor Bosco. Four. Councillor Sakala. Charles Mastroberti. There's 11 in favor, none against, no abstentions. Moving on to the top of page five. There's no appointments. Item C of town manager appointment, town council approved. Item D, P and Z commission appointed. There are none. Council approved. Moving on to item 14, items, items for discussion. Item A, there is no consent agenda. Item B1 remains on the table. It's a resignation. Um, item C, appointments, town manager appoint, appointed, council approved. There are none. Item D, P and Z commission appointed, council approved. There are none. Items E, F, G, and H have been moved to miscellaneous. We move to item 15, a miscellaneous. E, F, G, and H. I, didn't I say that? H. H. E, F, G, and H have been moved to miscellaneous. Moving on to item E under miscellaneous. Discussion resolution eliminating the administrative assistant position under the register of voters, voters and transfer the funds of $14,000. Whereas the register of order, voters wishes to eliminate the part-time administrative assistant position for net savings to the town and transfer the available funding to the stipend and temporary seasonal line items. Be it resolved, the Enfield Town Council does hereby eliminate the part-time administrative position under the register of voters. Further being resolved that in accordance with Chapter 6, Section 8F of the town charter, the following transfer is hereby made. Register of voters, stipend of 10,000, excuse me, two register of voters, stipend, temporary and seasonal of 10,000 and 4,000. From the register of voters, salaries part-time of 14,000. Certified on January 6th that the funds are available by John Wilcox, our director of finance. Approved by our account manager, Christopher Bronson. So moved. By Councilor Muller. Second. Seconded by uh, Councilor Mangini. Um, do we want anything to bring up the register or gentlemen are welcome to come up. Do you have anything you want to add? Welcome. We'll be quick, thank you. No worries. Thank you. Welcome. Good evening. Good evening. Name and just name and title, if you wouldn't mind, for the record, Tom please. Tom Kinsler, Republican Registrar Voters. Uh, Lou Fiore, Democratic Registrar Voters. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you. Yes, so, sir. so uh, we we brought this uh, idea forth because the position that currently has been in place for several years has um, a very seasonal flavor to it as far as workload goes. So we struggled, Lou and I, with how to keep someone busy 52 weeks out of the year and the position is an intense position for 20 to 26 weeks a year with the canvassing that we do election prep follow up on elections but a lot of the time during the year it's low workload just simple registration of voters a couple hours a day um, and we came up with the idea to give the town back uh, we figured about nine thousand dollars out of that line item and beef up uh, and bring in the deputies more uh, for more hours. In addition, create a, a safe space of money for temporary workers that we would use uh, right before an election during canvas time, both to help train as we bring people up through the uh, election workers' uh, levels and to help us during those crunch times. So it just made much more sense. It, it affords the town about $9,000 return to it now every year. And um, that's pretty much it. Any, if you have any questions. Yeah, we did try to fill this position three times over the last 14 months. And we were successful for a short period of time. We had a very capable person who filled the position for about two months. Unfortunately, her husband got transferred uh, out of the state and she had to move away. And we were unable to the other two times to fill this position. So basically, it's kind of thinking out of the box. After 
you know, 14 months of not having this admin and, and us trying to shuffle around the hours, Tom and I came up with this solution basically where we will man the office. The, the registrars are physically going to man the office with our deputies. And it's one of the reasons why we're asking to raise the deputies' pay because we're asking a lot more from them, a much more professional position. They're, we're going to be manning the office. And as Tom alluded to, it also gives us an opportunity to train some other of our moderators or assistant moderators, some of you know in the voting places, to come in as our seasonal help to help us in those push items. It gives us a lot more depth in the office, a lot more cross-training. It allows us to have a progression plan for, say, one of us isn't going to be the registrars anymore. So now we can actually start training people ahead of time instead of relying on an admin position. And as Tom alluded to, we're actually turning back over $8,000 in this year's budget. And it'll be, you know, next year's budget the same thing. So we're actually saving the taxpayers some money in doing this. The other piece to that was the position itself was required some skills, some decent skills. Uh, however, the, the people we would get to come in to apply for it could only be offered a 25-hour non-benefited position that was structured in basically daytime hours. And um, we were asking them to do things like, can you audit the card file and make sure they're in alphabetical order uh, when we were trying to find things for them to do. And it got to be where once we explained this in the interviewing process, there's going to be times and that type of thing. It ended up being where we had a lot of people turn us down that we would have hired and given a shot, but they, you know, I'm not going to do that for a living, you know. Yep. Uh, so, so that was the other piece to that that was frustrating. Any questions, Councilor Scala? I don't know that I have a problem with this per se, but what I, what I'm confused at is why are we doing this now, and not in budget. Um, why is this coming to us now and not during your budget presentations when you go through the town manager and the town manager's office and then they put together their collective budget after you guys present to him and then we go through our deliberations. I guess I'm just, yeah. I'm confused as to why, why this is happening now. Excellent question. Um, the reason it's happening now is because we got through a long period of wasting time and energy and funds uh, and people's time out of the HR department trying to fill the position. We decided that we were just not going to do this. We're going to put this before the council and this idea and see if it works. Um, we have a canvas coming up in a couple of weeks, which is going to be a crunch time. And then we have right after that a primary. So we want to have this in place and the system in place and the hours in place with the deputies so that it's, there's no hurdle. If we waited till the June budget, um, it would be a struggle. That's really simply. And, and, and actually, we wanted to come in front of you earlier than this, Councilman Sakala, but by charter, we had to wait till January. We wanted to actually come in front of you uh, back October. in November, October, November, but we had to really wait until now in January. Oh, OK. So. What if this doesn't work? How does that, would we just go through the budget process and put a position back in and rework it? We would, at that time, Lou's already talked, we've talked extensively about that. You know, what if in five years everything changes, there's new rules, there's new laws, whatever. I'm, I'm talking about like one year. But whatever. But I'm just saying we would then address it and go forward from there. There's I, I miss, I'm sorry, Councilman Scott, I missed your question. I, I apologize. You I said, what if this doesn't work? What if you realize within six months, a year, whatever, then we do, we have to deal with this again in the budget? Yeah, that, that, that's a good question. Tom and I have discussed, as Tom's alluded to, this works because the four of us want to make it work. And it used to frankly. work. It used to be the and way. It used to be this way back prior to around 2004. And the four of us want to make this work. Councilman Sakala is absolutely right. We could get a couple of new players in the registrar's office, uh, say a new Democratic registrar, a new Democratic deputy, who don't want to make this work. Well, you know, that, that, you know that's, that's in it. That could be an issue. But all we can tell you is basically the four of us want to make this work. We think this is the best uh, direction for the town to go at this point in time. As Tom alluded, we had, we tried three times to fill this position, somebody $16 an hour. Uh, we were asking a lot from a PC standpoint and a skills standpoint to work 24 hours a week, four days a week, and, and we, we just we couldn't fill this position, to be quite frank with you. So mm -hmm. this is, we understand the pitfalls, uh, but we're, we're willing to make try to make this work. We think this is in the best interest of the town going forward. Okay. Right, we, we, we have talked about that. We fully understand your concern, Councilman Sakala. All right, thanks.
so I don't have a problem with this. My question to you, gentlemen, is so if JFK is unusable in the fall, if I recall the numbers from the last presidential election, JFK alone had a, almost 10,000 voters yep. alone. And I remember. Six, 64. It was 60. I'm sorry, okay, 64. And it was there, but the line was all the way out into yep. the parking lot. It was very so well where represented. Are we gonna, where are we going to, if it's not available, where are we going for, sorry, go ahead. We, 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 we have, yeah, we mm, have mm, tentative mm, plans mm, and we will be coming. Unfortunately, this will be the third time you're going to see us in a couple right, months. Good. I know you saw us last month. Yeah. You're seeing us tonight. You're going to see us again. All right. We, we, we've we, made, we've made closing. steps. We've yeah, okay. had meetings. Uh, we've gone over options and we're not ready yet. Okay. To, All right, fair enough. Because of yep. the, because of the whole situation, we fair will uh, be coming very shortly with. Good. All right, I'm glad you're already know, looking at. Chris, you want to, if you want to chime in oh, on I, that. They've they've are very good. They're activist registrars. Um, they're proactive, and I think this proposal is evidence of that. You know, the HR director has been assisting with them. They've tried very diligently to fill the position. It just isn't really, for all the aforementioned reasons, something people are interested in once they hear about the specifics. So again, as I spoke earlier, that what we're trying to do, and we've done it, the same thing, taking one position and a salary and sort of divvied it up to be more efficient. That's what they've done, and I, I commend them for it. Okay. Um, I just you folks some opportunity which yeah is more, more people isn't job. always the yeah. answer you know if you have dedicated right. people willing to take on a little more and you have that core group right. so i think this again is people looking at the situation they have and being able to break the mold and sometimes and we're going to be doing this in the next budget and in some other years going back to the past and some of the formulations of staff that we had before that really were less that worked better and i think uh as they've been very candid, they're going to try it. They're going to give it a good shot. And if, if it doesn't work out or they have difficulty, or there's, they'll come back and we'll address it then. But I commend them for their innovativeness and their commitment to making the registrar's office better, more productive. And as I said, a savings, a net savings to the town. I mean, that's commendable, and I thank them. One, one more on JFK, if I can thank you. Sure, Tommy. right ahead. One more on, uh, on JFK is uh, thank you very much, Councilor Mueller. We were, we, we were uh, Rose. Uh, Rosalie's our, our liaison here. She Phyllis and she's been working with the project manager, so he's fully aware that we need to hold the primary, the April 28th primary at JFK, on that side of the building with the parking. He's fully aware of that the project, and we've assured them that we'll be out of there by April 30th. That's why we'll be coming back All in right, front of you with another proposal right. probably next month where we need Perfect. to move that polling yep. place to. Perfect, Councilman Jeannie. Thank you, <clears throat> you know, both for your um, clever, you know thinking and approach and looking uh, to save money for the town. Will your uh, budget be reflective of what you're looking to do from here, from January going forward? Because budget yes. time is right around the corner. Yep, yep, yep. yep. And this, will, this will be included in our new budget also. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. And I will tell you, last year what we did uh, was unique. Some of the smaller departments, we didn't have them come forward. We met with them. We looked at their budgets. This year probably will be required. Um, because they have been looking for uh, some spatial concerns, considerations they have, and also there's some equipment, uh, cabinetry, and, and other things that are not significant in the scheme of the budget, but significant to theirs that we'll have to make you aware of. So we'll be looking at those matters during the, the course of the budget. And as Lou had said, under our finance, we can't do these type of transfers and changes until January 1st, although they had alerted us, uh, us to this months ago and wanted to come forward. We just couldn't do it under the charter. So I, I commend them, as I said, they're very proactive. And Mike, just to finish the answer to your question, um, when we come forward, we've already gone through the, the what if we have a crisis option, where, where are we going to take the vote, where would we like my, to go? My more worries parking. That's yeah, and that's, that's been a giant part okay. of that. Yeah. 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 Right. And that's been yeah. a giant to, part of our Down discussion. to actually right. counting spaces. Yeah, yeah. we've okay. gone yeah. places and counted. Yep. Oh, very good. Twice. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, gentlemen. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Nice to see everybody. Thank you. You as well. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Thank you. Roll call. Su Suzanne, please. Councillor Hamler. Four. Councillor Kiner. Four. Mayor Ludwig. Four. Councillor Mancini. Four. Councillor Muller. Four. Councillor Riley. Four. Councillor Sarraza. Four. Deputy Mayor Suzak. Four. Councillor Ungeyer. Four. Councillor Bosco. Four. Councillor Sakala. Four. Is 11 in favor, none against, no abstentions. Moving on to item F, discussion resolution authorizing the town manager to sign the options to purchase agreement with Bell Site Development LLC. Whereas the town of Enfield has interest in purchasing a portion of the property known as 90 Alden Ave, Enfield, Connecticut, consistent of approximately 36,900 square feet, including 9,490 plus square feet gymnasium. Whereas Bell Site 
Development LLC is willing to grant to the town an option to purchase the property at any time during a 24-month option period, whereas the purchase price shall be determined by two licensed commercial real estate appraisers who shall be mutually agreed upon by the parties. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the town manager, Christopher W. Bronson, is authorized to enter into an option to purchase agreement in the name and on behalf of the town of Enfield with Bell Site Development LLC, subject to review and approval by the town attorney submitted on December 23rd, 2019 to the Office of Community Development. So, so move, second. By council, uh, motion made by council, Councilwoman uh, Mangini, second by Councilman Muller. I don't know if there's any brief, but I think this is pretty straightforward. I think it is. Yeah. Briefly, the count, we've been working on this for a period of time. This is over uh, Santa Dalberts and the same developer that did the um, conversion of the classrooms to apartments, which was very successful, fully occupied. Also has at the back of the school this you know, former gymnasium, an area that was a theater with bathrooms and kitchens. Um, and it's it's something that he had offered to the town. Um, councils have take, councilors have taken a tour of it. Um, we hope to incorporate this into a plan to offer more uh, and better recreation services in, the, in regard to basketball and theatrics in that area. Um, we did due diligence. We asked the developer for cost estimates, looking primarily to restore this because we needed to know, is it something that's in our wheelhouse to afford um, going forward? And he, he gave us that information for the floors and the ceilings, and it seemed to be a reasonable amount. So this secures the property for two years, gives us that option to be able to purchase it at an agreed upon price later. If we're not interested after we do further inspections or the costs do become too high, the council is free to uh, exit the agreement. But I, I think it's good, it's part, and whether or not we do Higgins Park or, or something separate, I think this is a, a valuable asset a lot of people had played basketball there, former counselors, people have been familiar. So it's retaining a piece of our history and also offering better services, I think, for a very reasonable price and just not ripping something down and looking. As we know, the basketball court at Lamani is, is rather small. The pool there um, needs quite a bit of uh, money to improve it. And this also, as I said, has bathrooms, kitchens, theatrical space. So for, I think, a modicum of cost, we could have a real gem in uh, that area of town, which the whole town, not just Thompsonville, could utilize. So for those reasons, I think it's a it's a good investment of this amount of money uh, to hold the property and give us those options. Any questions? Your none roll call, please. Councillor Hemler. Four. Councillor Kiner. Four. Mayor Ludwig. Four. Councillor Mangini. Four. Councillor Muller. Four. Councillor Riley. Four. Councillor Terraza. Four. Deputy Mayor Suzak. Four. Councillor Ungeyer. Four. Councillor Bosco. Four. Councillor Sakala. Four. There's 11 in favor, none against, no abstentions. Moving on, to, moving on to item G in miscellaneous. Resolution uh, removing Lodestar as the town's authorized representative for virtual net metering. Whereas on July 1st, 2019, the town council appointed Lodestar Energy LLC as the town's author, authorized representative pertaining to virtual net metering. And whereas town staff has had discussions with Lodestar Energy representatives to negotiate the contract, and the parties have been unable to reach a satisfied, satisfactory agreement. Now, therefore, be it resolved, the Info Town Council here does hereby cancels the, and rescinds Lodestar Energy LLC appointment as a town authorized representative for virtual net metering, created by the town manager's office on December 23, 2019. By Councillor Muller, seconded by <coughs> by Councillor Mangini. Yeah, just briefly, yeah. Uh, the town had entered into this agreement, sort of just a quick letter of commitment at the time to further explore the project uh, subject to negotiating the terms and the contract. Uh, unfortunately, uh, upon further discussion, it didn't seem to be a good fit. Staff worked hard, so did Lodestar, but we couldn't come to mutually agreed upon terms in the contract uh, that we believed were in the town's best interest. So based on the recommendation not only of the assistant manager, but also of our finance director and our assistant town attorney, we are recommending that we just cancel the agreement. Again, much like the last one, we, we make sure when we enter into agreements that there is an escape clause to the council after we do due diligence and if it's something that we um, become disinclined to actually culminate and sign we can get out of it at no cost and that's what happened here we made it, it, it looked good and we wish them well they're probably still going to be proceeding with the project in the town just we won't be part of it in buying the um, virtual energy um, that they've offered us so we wish them well any questions again I agree staff did a great job making sure the details were you the know, devils in the reviewed. details the de exactly and I think they found a big devil so I appreciate we appreciate it um, roll call please Councillor Hemler. Four. Councillor Kiner. Four. Mayor Ludwig. Four. Councillor Mancini. Four. 
Councillor Muller. Four. Councillor Riley. Four. Councillor Sarazzo. Four. Deputy Mayor Souza. Four. Councillor Ungayer. Four. Councillor Bosco. Four. Councillor Sakala. Four. It's 11 in favor, and against, no abstentions. Item H, discussion resolution, resolution regarding appointment of the town attorney. Be it resolved, the Enfield Town Council does hereby appoint James Talbert as town attorney for the town of Enfield, effective January 6, 2020, for a term which expires on December 31, 2021. Be it further resolved that the Enfield Town Council does hereby authorize Mayor Mike Ludwig to sign the employment agreement with James Talbert as town attorney for the town of Enfield, submitted on December 19, 2019, by the town manager's office. So by Councillor Muller. Second. By Councillor Sparaza. I mean, I don't, we'll turn the floor over to you. Well, it's an appointment by the council, but as, you know, uh, helping uh, Steve is away today, he probably would have been our spokesman for, for HR. He headed up the search committee. Um, we did the advertisements, um, and I think in large part due to the JI article that Jessica wrote, uh, we were thankful in regard to highlighting Maria and her departure after about 30 years. We got a very robust um, application pool uh, over two and a half times what we got last time, and I'm sure um, those who inquire, Steve, can make that available. Very, very fine, well-qualified candidates. The council, after a interview process with the top number of contenders, uh, chose Attorney Talberg. Um, he has been somebody who has been known to the town. He has done insurance defense work on cases going back uh, uh, many number of years for the town. He has acquitted himself well and defended the town well. I think uh, all of the members of the previous council had uh, dealt with him on a number of cases and were impressed with his his uh, professionalism, his skill, and his he has a very nice nature about him. So I think you made a really good choice. I'm sure there will be articles going into his back background and um, his career, um, but I think you've made a wonderful choice. He's going to be a good fit. He's here this evening. We look forward to him joining the Enfield team. I think he's going to be a great addition, and I will tell you, having been there, it's a very important position. Um, it is someone who advises the council, who's directly responsible to you, so it's critical that we get a person of his caliber uh, and his professionalism to fulfill that position and all the many challenges that are going to confront the town coming forward. And I will just say as a preview, you know, it is a more litigious society and people have the right to bring lawsuits uh, for most any reason and that's what makes America great but when we're on the receiving end of it we want the best person there to defend us and at the end of the day we're not able many times to comment on pending litigation and it's only our attorney who can speak for us so it's important to have somebody uh, who has a great uh, depth of experience and I will tell you uh, attorney Talberg fits the bill in all areas but also in particular being a litigator uh, there are all types of attorneys real estate attorneys attorneys, property attorneys, and then there are those lawyers who actually litigate and try cases in the state and federal court. Many lawyers in Connecticut limit their practice to the state court. We're seeing a lot more lawsuits that are brought that have a federal component, and therefore we're brought into the federal court, which is a completely different kettle of fish. Attorney Talberg is an expert and a specialist in federal court, so I think we've done very well to have him apply and for this council uh, to have chosen him. So I will join you after your vote in welcoming Attorney Talberg. Any chance? I mean, uh, he's welcome to come up. Or? Why don't you uh, vote appoint him, him, vote him, right, and then so you then, can have him come so up. Before, <laughs> one second, there's an amendment um, being offered for the date prepared because we didn't, we since we interviewed uh, folks on the 30th, the date prepared should be January 3rd, 2020. Right. So I make amendment to the uh, resolution to resit or cross out December 19, 2019, and add January 3rd, 2020. Nice catch by Councilwoman Sakala. I want to give her the credit. Second it by Councilor Speraza. Any discussion on the amendment made on the date? Hearing none, by show of hands, all those in favor of making a change in the amendment? Opposed, abstentions, 11 in favor, zero against. Main motion as amended, any questions? Hearing none, roll call, please. Councilor Hemler. Four. Councilor Kiner. Four. Mayor Ludwig. Four. Councilor Mangini. Four. Councilor Muller. Four. Councilor Riley. Four. Councillor Sparaza. Four. Deputy Mayor Suzak. Four. Councillor Ungeyer. Four. Councillor Bosco. Four. Councillor Sakala. Four. There's 11 in favor, none against, and no abstentions. Well, sir, if you wouldn't mind coming up real quick. And welcome. Yes. Congratulations. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, thank you. Welcome to the town of Enfield. <laughs> well, uh, First one, and and we'll, you have the floor, so introduce yourself to the town, and you're welcome to, you know, uh, 
Are you welcome to sit too? May, by the may way, I sir? stand? I'm accustomed stand. That's fine. to uh, right. orating. I try not to <laughs> orate too much. It's late. I'll get you out of here. But uh, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, um, from the bottom of my heart, I truly appreciate the uh, vote of confidence and the selection. Uh, I first had the pleasure of representing the town of Enfield in around 1998, when I was about a second year or third year associate. Um, it was a uh, land use dispute, and I'm happy to say that we won, we prevailed. Uh, that was the start of a long relationship. Over the past two decades, I've represented the town and its employees in a number of different matters uh, that have all turned out, I think, well, well enough for the town. And so for, for that reason, I'm particularly thrilled uh, when I heard that there was going to be this opening uh, that I put my name in and uh, was fortunate enough to get your vote of approval. And so I, uh, I'm so excited about the things that are going on. Uh, from the town manager, uh, just the level of enthusiasm and the you, you have unanimous votes, which is such a pleasure from something I'm not accustomed to with all of my clients that I visit around the state. Um, so that's really to your credit. Um, I'm also especially grateful that we're going to have uh, a wealth of knowledge with uh, the former town attorney, with, with Chris and Maria and Mark. I met with them uh, this afternoon, and I'll be back tomorrow morning to really dive in, just hit the ground running. And so um, what else can I say except that uh, I'm grateful. It's a privilege and an honor. I look forward to working with each and every one of you. and. I pledge to you um, that uh, we'll, we'll do great things here over the next two years. Very good. Welcome. And if you're welcome to take your seat by the end, for the end of the meeting. <laughs> okay, fair enough. <laughs> Make sure you can adjust the seating. I know, you know. <laughs> Nameplate will be on order tomorrow. <laughs> yes, exactly right. Very good. We move on to item 16, public communication. Would anyone like to speak for the council at this time? Jack. Welcome, sir. Thank you. Jack Sheridan, 7 Buchanan Road. I, uh, I guess I'm not real clear or good at presenting what I'm trying to present. I'll go to uh, the police lights. My concern was about the safety of the police because they're so bright that people driving by have trouble seeing, and that's what my concern was. Um, and. Uh, Six hundred thousand dollars for the for the transfer station. You take eighty-seven thousand out. That leaves five thirteen. You can build a palace for five hundred thirteen thousand for a few guys down there. So that needs to be looked at. Um, hit back on the recycling. On the new recycling. I don't know how many of you guys read the actual new recycling thing that came, but it's not taking shredded paper anymore. Never took shredded paper. Why? And that, I always put it in there, never had a problem. And then <coughs> I, I remember one time I put pizza box in and I got a little note, you can't take a pizza box. Now, now you can take pizza boxes. Whoa, what? And lids and yogurt containers. Can't take yogurt containers? They're plastic. It specifically says no yogurt containers. So somebody has to at least try and make that <coughs> more clear. Um, and the, and the, let's see, I want to make sure I didn't lose anything. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, let's see. Oh, no one addressed the, uh, the fiduciary on the uh, Playhouse players. And if I, if I remember, and I could have this wrong, but I thought Tom Arnone was going to be watching over that. No. I know, I know that was part of the discussion, yeah. but whoever it was, I'm just wondering if it got lost in the new council or maybe, you know, something, something got lost there. That's all. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, Jack. How you going? Anyone else like to speak for the council? Yeah, who's just going to tell us about how to buy yeah. Wendy, welcome. Lucian, you're next. It's been a long time. Welcome. Happy New Thank Year. Thank you. Yes, happy holidays, everyone. Wendy Osada, 8 Windmill Road. 
First, I have to say that um, I was a little disappointed when I saw the tree trimming on the agenda. I thought we were going to be talking about maybe a Christmas tree trimming activity next year, and we were getting an early start. So I was a little bummed out when I saw the presentation, although it was very informative, and I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I, I just, I, again, I always come. I never plan on saying anything, and then as I sit and I listen to what is said um, throughout the evening, I just wanted to um, make some comments about a few remarks that were made earlier. Um, first of all, it's not that I don't think a lot of the residents, if we if you pay any attention to town governing at all, you do understand that expenditures over a certain dollar amount do require a referendum. All right, that goes without saying. I think the point that one of our previous speakers was trying to make is that is there an opportunity to perform maintenance more frequently and in smaller increments so that the dollar amounts don't exceed what you need to do you know, a referendum, and so that you don't wait until a building is in such disrepair that it requires multi-million dollars to be able to fix it. So I think that's that was the point that was trying to be made. Is there an opportunity to just do more of that maintenance on an ongoing basis in smaller amounts, keep things from falling into such disrepair? Um, also, I'm a little skeptical of one of the previous speaker's comments that not many students participate in extracurricular activities. Uh, just on my cell phone on the internet, briefly while I was here, I checked there are uh, 18 sports teams just at Enfield High School alone. That doesn't count the middle school. And there's 57 clubs. And so I would have to say that that's probably a fairly large number of students that do actually participate. And keep in mind, you know, families uh, live in bigger houses. Bigger houses generate more tax revenue for the town. And if we show any kind of a lack of commitment to our students, not just from an educational perspective, but also from that extracurricular perspective, which is usually very important to a lot of families, then you may make us less appealing. And so that family that might be considering moving into Enfield you know, may not consider it after all, or the family that's in Enfield may consider moving somewhere else. I personally know people that literally move their kids to another town because of the athletic opportunities that were available. So there's got to be a balance. I, I fully support that, you know, the education itself has got to be the number one priority, but there does have to be a balance there, um, you know, as far as um, making sure that we also have some strong athletic programs and some extracurricular activities. So that's all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Lucian. Welcome, sir. Lucian Lefebvre, 54 Kimberly Drive. Uh, Thank you, Joe, for putting me on the spot here with the, the Reese thing. I, I have to call Pam. Uh, <laughs> okay, uh, what Joe is referring to is right now, Reese Across America is doing a sponsor one, get one wreath. So for the cost of one wreath, you end up with two that end up hopefully in St. Pat's Cemetery to where we can cover every grave next year, every veteran's grave. Uh, if you send an email to Enfield, WAA, at yahoo.com, Pam will answer the message and send you a direct link to the Reese Across America, which puts you into the St. Pat's Cemetery, because their normal thing is a, a bear to, to wander through their website. So this puts you into the uh, link directly to St. Pat's Cemetery, and there's also a list of uh, fundraiser groups in there. And in order to do the sponsor one, get one, you have to pick one of the, spon the uh, fundraiser groups, and they, they vary from veterans organizations to the PTOs to different things. Pick one of your choice. And this is good until January 15th online. So right now, it's got to shift strictly to online. And again, it's sponsor one, get one. And I'm not sure. I know on the paper form there's a place, and I'm sure on there there is also. If you plan on picking the wreath up to put on a specific grave, indicate that on the form. Otherwise, it goes in with the, the general wreaths that are going to St. Pat's. So again, if you're planning on picking the wreath up, they set them aside for those people that wanted to do that. and. Uh, the ones that are non-specific will go on a veteran's grave. And uh, I just want to recap this year. We were 500, roughly 550 wreaths short to do the entire cemetery. First time we've ever come, they've ever come that close in 10 years. This was the largest number ever for the cemetery. And the goal is to get every one. And right now it's between 16 and 1,700 graves. And it's a moving target with losing veterans on a daily basis and depending which cemetery they end up in. So in, in, re 
to your other question, Pam's going to be on the agenda for uh, the February 3rd meeting. So that's the reason she didn't come tonight. And uh, again, go to send an email to EnfieldWAA at yahoo.com. And Pam will respond. We'll send you the direct link to uh, the Reese Across America St. Pat's section specifically. And again, you know, indicate how many if you plan on picking it up directly. And uh, you have to choose a fundraiser group. So the PTO gets to get some funds, the veterans groups. So your choice of who you want for a fundraising group. So uh, for the third time, I'll let it go again. Enfield, W-A-A, at yahoo.com. So Good job. You got till <laughs> January 15th online to do that. You know, get as many as we can. The goal is to cover that cemetery next year. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Anyone else like to speak for the council this time? Going once, going twice. Public communications is closed. Moving on to item 17, Councilor Communications. Councilor Bosco. Yeah, something just to touch on what Wendy said. Remember, we even have our houses. We may have our boilers and furnace tuned up every year, but eventually they wear out and they need to be replaced. You know, you put a roof on your house, it's fine for 20 years, and then you need to replace it. So this is not as much, you know, you can say all you want about if we did the maintenance. We are doing the maintenance, but things wear out. And the problem is, is if you get a building that's, 30 years old, everything seems to wear out about the same time. So uh, that's why these buildings end up needing a lot. And then we get other things. As school roofs are so expensive, you, you just can't do them. All you can do is patch them and patch them and patch them until you get a referendum and get a roof. And, you know, we, we, we tried that a long time ago to, to try to get all our buildings fixed when money was cheap. People were hurting for work. And we missed the opportunity. So it's not that we don't try, but, you know, you, when things get old, they start to break. And all the maintenance in the world, all you end up doing is patching them. Thank you. Anyone else? Councilor Riley. So I just want to say first readers trivia night is coming up. It's February 22nd. It's a Saturday evening, 7 o'clock. Snow, no snow. It's going to be happening. <laughs> Doors open at 630 at Mount Carmel. Um, tickets are on sale online through Eventbrite, um, or you can just pay at the door. A table of 10 is $130, and an individual ticket is 15 So um, I hope that you come out and uh, join us for a fun night. Um, and then I just had a couple of other comments um, for uh, the recycling. Um, I agree. It would be kind of nice to know, like, are we tied by... Um, the people that um, we pay to take the recycling away and they dictate what we can or can't recycle. That would be kind of a nice thing to know when we have our garbage presentation. <laughs> um, and then just about the schools. Um, we, in the state of Connecticut, we have a minimum budget requirement and we can't go underneath that unless um, you severely decrease the student population and that's also based on a uh, formula that includes free and reduced lunch. Um, also, you're correct, um, for high performing districts, you can have the MBR reduced, but you have to be in the top 10% of the entire state to have that reduced. Um, and I also think that, you know, kids are so into their devices and stuff these days. Um, if we don't have other outlets, as extracurricular activities, we won't have well-rounded students to go out into the world and uh, be active participants. So those are all things to take into consideration when budget time comes around. But that's it. Thanks. Thank you. Councilor Conner. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> I'd like to get something off my chest that's been bothering me for a while, and hopefully uh, my colleagues will afford me this, uh, this opportunity. Um, and, and the issue that I'm referring to involves the, uh, the planning and zoning vote of our last town council meeting. And um, what happened at that meeting, what happened with that vote, I, I find troublesome. Now, I remember quite vividly when Councilman Sferraza and I were, were sworn in better than a year ago. 
uh, Councilman Sarraza, with his usual eloquence, said that we are not, I'm, I'm paraphrasing now, and I think other members also said the same thing, that we, as members of the town council, do not represent Democrats, we don't represent Republicans, we represent the people, and I applaud you for that, Councilor Sarraza. That did not happen at the last meeting. Our minority leader nominated someone who was truly qualified, and that was Anthony DePace. We're not saying that the other candidate who was nominated by the majority party was not qualified. She was also qualified. No one's, no one's going to debate that. What troubles me is this was truly a Democratic appointment. The minority leader nominated Mr. DePace. It was seconded. The councilwoman from the 3rd District, a member of the Republican Party, nominated Mrs. Scott. That was seconded. Vote was taken. The requisite six votes were not garnered. And as such, the motion failed. We voted today to put Mrs. Scott on planning and zoning. And I think that was a good choice. But what bothers me is we have a process that we conform to. And when that process is followed, the wheels of government turn well. When we don't conform to that process, there are problems. And I'm addressing that problem tonight. Now, I respect each and every one of you on the town council, regardless of your political affiliation. None of us serve here for our egos, for money. We serve because we care about this town, we care about the people, and I respect each and every one of you, regardless of political party. And I really hope in the future that even though we are in a minority, someday the minority does become a majority. I think what we have to recognize is we have a process that process was abrogated, I believe, at that last meeting. And I just hope that doesn't happen again. And if the majority party has a problem with the qualifications of anyone that we nominate, please tell us, either before the meeting, during the meeting, whatever. But nothing was ever said about Mr. DePace that was negative. Here is a man who served, I think, 12 years on planning and zoning. He was chair of planning and zoning for a number of years. He was certainly qualified. No one's going to debate that. But the process, which I hold dear, was not followed. And that bothers me. I just had to get that off my chest tonight. And again, as I said, I, I, there's no reason to debate this further. I just wanted to get this off my chest and just say that hopefully in the future, uh, you will regard the wishes of the minority party, as we will regard your desires and your wishes as well. Thank you for that courtesy, ladies and gentlemen. Anyone else? Hearing none, but do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Councilor Muller, followed by Councilor Spraz, all those in favor? We are adjourned. Good night, everyone. Happy New Year. <laughs>